The superstition mountains have claimed many souls to her own wilderness over the years. Yet she remains a beacon for the adventurous and the naive. Andy, Alina, and Charles hike casually along the trail leading directly into the mountains that are right ahead of them. They catch themselves looking upwards at glances to see some of the large mountains as they approach. They pass a sign that clearly says, Superstition Wilderness, enter at your own risk. After some time of hiking upwards, Charles begins to hang back to catch his breath. Just then he hears a small rock slide in the distance. He looks back, and he doesn't see anything. Figures it could just be an animal. I mean, it is the wilderness after all. Alina places her hand right on his shoulder, jolting him really quick, just before she consoles him in the moment, reminding him it's just her. You alright? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm alright. And he's looking back, not showing a break of sweat on him. Hey! You guys okay back there? Elena? CJ? Yeah, just a moment, Andy. All right, you sure you're all right to do this? Because you've still got to make it all the way back, remember? I know. I know. It's fine. Anyways, I think I'd rather be thinking of this, you know, when I'm going in. Besides, uh, doctors say it's good for the heart. Elena tuckers her lips, somewhat saddened to think about what Charles is making a point of. She picks up on the optimism that Charles is letting on. She responds to him. I know. I know. What? Well, hey, here. Have this. Elena digs into her pockets and pulls out her own personal rabbit's foot. A charm she's kept on her for a while now. She places the charm directly into his palm and closes his hand. Charles does recognize the importance of this. Elena, isn't your family hella stitious? Eh, they won't mind what they don't know. Like this whole trip. So I think I'd rather you have it. Elena pauses and looks down. Charles follows her gaze and realizes she's looking at his hospital band that's ringing out from his sleeve on his wrist. Embarrassed, he quickly shoves it back in. Her eyes are reassuring, as if to non-verbally apologize. Andy's up ahead, taking a swig of his water just before he goes to say something. Guys, we still got plenty of mountain to climb, and our water is getting hot already. Charles, I love you, bro, but I am not carrying All right, all right, I'm up. We can go. I didn't, uh, didn't realize we had, uh, whatever. <laughs> Moments later, they both huffed it back to Andy. The trio continued to climb their way to the top of the incline of the trail. When they neared a point where the trail was just beginning to plateau, something ahead struck them. A campsite, built and open, but vacant. Whoa. Guys... We've got a camp over here. Charles and Elena stare ahead before finding themselves scouting the area with their eyes. They then follow Andy from a distance towards the campsite. Well, this looks... unattended. Probably not far off. Andy turns to see Charles walking off, in the opposite direction. Elena turns and looks too. When Charles gets near a rock ledge at the end of the open area, he sets down his backpack and gear before turning around and realizing he's at his friend's attention and curiosity. Uh, I don't think they'll mind just a moment, right? You know what? I'm sure this is fine. Obviously having been silent about her need for a break, Elena agrees with a sharp matter-of-factly nod. She heads over where Charles is and relieves herself of the weight of her backpack. And he finally comes around, backpacks harnessed in hand, but he's still keeping his eyes out on everything around them, shifting his eyes side to side as if somehow still suspicious of their environment. He finally drops it in front of the other bags. All three of them stand there listening intently to the environment around them. It's so quiet. Yeah. It's nice. Andy doesn't seem amused. 
His concerned gaze falls back onto the tent in the area around it. He's starting to notice the supplies and various items scattered on the ground just outside of its entrance. His friends hadn't walked any closer to it yet, so they had no idea. Although, Elena does notice Andy's intrigue. She fixates on what he's doing and wanders off from Charles. Andy? He just keeps walking straight to the tent and begins to inspect the scene. He hasn't looked inside the tent yet. Andy? You see something? I don't know. I don't know yet. What's with all this shit lying around? Charles catches up to Elena and walks with her. Andy kneels at the front of the tent and stares at his unzipped opening, hesitant to look in. He finally peeks his head inside the tent and looks around by swiveling his head. He sees a backpack stood against a pair of boots and other various equipment along with two sleeping bags, one torn page from a notebook with the paperweight on top of it. His friends are approaching. Really? We're doing this now? Wait, hold on, Charles. I think... Andy, what is it? Everything's strolled out. Like it's been dug through. It's a mess, but most of the stuff still seems like it's here. And he pulls his head out from the tent and looks back to them. It's admittedly kind of weird. Elena walks and makes a beeline straight to the tent and peeks inside with her whole torso in. Oh, come on. Charles throws his head back in reaction. <sighs> Charles begins to walk, but stops when he hears more dirt moving somewhere behind him. He diligently scans for any more movement. Meanwhile, Alina backs out of the tent and faces back to Andy. Two sleeping bags, but one backpack. There's a paper. What's it say? Andy quickly looks around to confirm any onlookers. After he confirms there's not, he ducks into the tent entirely. And Alina glances to Charles and sees that he's distracted by something further off, perhaps just watching the environment. You see something? No, just animals, I guess. I've been hearing them a lot, too. Oh, yeah? You see any? Uh, no. Now that you mention it, but... Is that so unusual? This is a public trail. Alina doesn't look satisfied with the response. She's catching herself giving in to the sense of paranoia. Hey, let's take it easy. Let's relax a bit. Trash Chents just got us spooked is all. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it could just be abandoned. Emergencies at home, only meant for temporary usage. Pretty expensive temporary usage. It happens. I think. Charles notices her nuance, that she's undoubtedly unsettled and is trying to rationalize something for herself. Yeah, it happens. I mean, we do got rich folk who live in the mountains. Drunk parties, I mean, the place is trash, so who knows? Elena breaks a small smirk across her cheek. Thanks, Charles. Andy comes out of the tent with a wrinkled paper. His face is of stern concern. So, what does it say? I think it's a journal. Or, uh, just look at this. Andy holds the paper out for his friends towards Elena and hands it off. When she grabs it, she immediately notices it's covered in dirt smudges at the corners and sides of the paper, in the shape of fingerprints with small traces of red mixed in. The writing on the note seems scratched in, no doubt written under great stress. Here, let me read it's that. okay. It's okay. We tried to make contact. We're lost. Middle of the night, broken leg. No way of navigation and can't call. Being stalked, but can't see who. Act like vultures. Gotta go. They're sneaky. They're sneaky? They act like vultures. Do you think animals did this? I don't know. Call it in. Get some help. Elena's already lifting her phone out of her pocket and dialing. Uh, I have no bars. Try anyways. Both Andy and Charles lift their phones too, and both come to the same realization. Seriously? You've got to be kidding me. Neither of them have bars. They watch Elena make her call. (laughs) 
Andy's expression drops when he sees all the bags and supplies that they had just sacked to the side are all gone. And he darts his head around before looking dead at Charles with a certain emptiness to his eyes. Charles? Where the hell did you put our bags? Our bags? They're just over the... What the fuck? Elena looks in on what has her friends troubled. Her face drops to frustration and confusion. All three of them hustle back to the edge of the area and look around frantically. Andy constantly looks to Charles. What the hell happened, look, Charles? I, I, I don't know. They... They were just here, just a second Are ago. Are you sure that they didn't fall off? Are you sure you didn't put them too close to the edge? I'll go check below. Elena! It's fine. It's fine. As she walks off, Andy huffs out a sigh of disappointment. <sighs> Shit, man. Look, it was right here, just a second ago. I walk over to you and I turn around and suddenly it's gone. Andy has a moment. While Charles begins to slowly get worked up over himself and Elena begins making her way down the path, Andy steps back and thinks for a second. He holds up the underside of his wrist and looks at his compass. The arm can't seem to find a place of focus. It's not working. His other quick gadgets and watch on his persons are all malfunctioned as well. A grave impression befalls Andy's face, like giving in to a bad gut feeling. Hey. Alina stops and looks to him. So does Charles after a moment. We should get out of here. Alright? We need to go. Charles visibly questions it but gives in to the idea. Alina seems accepting, although her face shows she's still processing the implications of the scenario at hand. The trio march along the trail across the flat part of the mountain. Elena and Charles are checking their phones for anything useful. GPS is out, of course. Let's not give too much away now. Is this the trail we took before? No, I... Didn't we go directly back the way we came? Yeah. Abrupt dirt skips are heard somewhere behind them. The group grows tense. Let's just keep walking. Andy stays ahead, acting as the scout leader. Charles finds himself slowing down to a stop. The rest of the group stops too. Okay, I don't know about this. You're sure we're headed back the way we came? Yeah, I don't know. You think the other way is clear? It feels like we're being watched. Huh? What? Wait, what? I said it feels like we're being watched. Well, there's three of us. Charles. Well, we need to get off this rock, and unless there's another way around... You're one to talk. Besides, you really want to chance that right now? We don't even know what this thing is. Or who. Yeah. Well, I guess it's different when you don't know if they have a gun. Shh. Charles looks at Andy after being shushed, but Andy only gives a stone-faced expression. Let's just keep walking. As they walk... Alina spots and transfixes on what looks like one of the backpacks. Um, guys. Is that my backpack? She starts to walk in this direction. Andy and Charles stop to look at what Elena's looking at. Oh my god, it's my stuff. Holy shit. Where's the rest of it? They all cautiously walk towards the backpack, burdened with a sense of paranoia. Andy's still looking ahead of the trail. In the distance, he notices a glimpse of movement, as if catching something or someone just duck out of sight. Andy pulls out his survival knife. Andy, what the hell are you doing? Stay here. Andy! It's no use, as Andy takes off full sprint down the trail where he'd seen the movement. When he gets there, he looks around. He notices a particular piece of ground that's disturbed. It looks like there's a trail that leads up to the rock walls to the higher elevated areas. Of course. His friends are coming, but instead of reaching out, he decides to climb the wall himself. He finds his grip and he pushes himself up. He keeps at it until he gets near the top. 
He finally reaches a ledge just before the summit, when his shirt is violently snagged on a large, big bush just next to him. He breaks away from it and pushes forward. Once he reaches the summit of flat grounds, he notices a shaded area completely unseen from the trail below. He begins to approach it, and as he makes his way, he lowers himself. He tilts his head, trying to get a better angle. He notices there's something in the shade. He draws his knife fist clenched around the handle tightly. He inches closer, and the object he was looking at takes an alarming shape. He begins to realize he's been looking at the silhouette of a person. Hey. Hey. The figure, slouched and unmoving, doesn't seem to respond. Andy pulls out his phone and shines his flashlight at it, revealing a pale-faced body with blood spattered from his neck. Oh my god. Andy shudders. He finds himself stepping backwards. Finally, turning to run back the way he came. He gets to the edge of the area, climbs down to the lower ledge where that large bush was. When, just then, the bush began to shake and rattle violently, twirling until, in a horrific instance, its entire veil comes off like a sheet. It unveils a fully suited and masked assailant wielding a knife. Andy is tackled to his back and he's forced to fight the gloved hands trying to pin him down. Finally, the assailant manages to hold Andy still with a knife to his throat. Andy can only see a masked man wearing desert cloaks and equipment suggesting he's combat trained, or at least coated and scrapped in scavenged gear. The masked assailant rips through Andy's pockets and tears out whatever valuables he can find. His phone, his wallet, his keys. Eventually, Andy tries something and gets a swing at the man. But the assailant quickly and violently retaliates. Charles and Elena are just below the area Andy climbed up, but they don't see the trail to get up there. Andy! Charles. A struggle is heard above them. Shit, shit, shit. Charles begins furiously trying to climb the wall. Just as Elena looks up, and her face goes pale, she steps away with a gasp, eyes fixated upward to the top of the wall. Small streams of rubble trickle down the rocks where he's trying to climb. And then he hears the steps above. He quickly gets down and backs away with Elena. As Charles turns to face where Elena's looking, he comes to witness the tall, cloaked assailant looking down at them. He holds a knife, still dripping with blood. Elena freaks out, screams, and makes a beeline straight down the trail without Charles. Elena! Elena just keeps running. Just then, rocks are heard sliding down and something heavy lands behind him. Charles wastes no time. He runs. Barely able to keep his balance, he pushes himself even when he's out of breath. His vision blurs as he catches himself stumbling, but the heavy footsteps of the assailant is right behind him. A pit of doubt grows in his gut as he pushes himself along, as he feels himself slowing down. Charles tries to catch up with Elena, but she's so far ahead. Get off me! Get off me! He wails and struggles, scared for his very life against this cloaked man twice his size. The assailant grabs and grapples at Charles, who keeps trying to fight and push him off. Get off me! Get off me! The assailant pulls out the bloody knife and holds it to Charles' throat while searching through his pockets for any obvious valuables, ripping any loose ornaments off. Charles sits still. In a brief look at the assailant, you can tell that his entire suit is practically made up of parts of other pieces of body armor, clothing, ghillie suit, so layered in attire and natural camouflage, he could have been right next to them the entire time, and they never noticed. 
Charles' medical bracelet dangles from his wrist. The assailant stares, knife still at Charles' throat. Charles breathes slowly and as quietly as he can. More movement is heard around the environment. Go. The assailant lifts his knife and just points his arm and finger firmly out in the opposite direction of where Elena has gone. Go. Charles bolts into get up on his feet. Without wasting a second more, he runs. Alina's exhaustion is starting to catch up with her. She's a ways down her trail and neither Charles nor Andy in sight. She stops for a moment to look around and catch her breath. She can't help but stare straight back, unsure of what's become of Charles. She unsheathes her arm from the strap of her backpack and hangs it to one shoulder. She digs into it for supplies, but she stops. A desert bush right next to her starts to shake. An animal? Instinctively, she backs off and prepares to run again when a small desert lizard scurries from out of the bush. She steps forward, feeling something's off with the air. After a moment, she juts back into a hasty run and zones out, tunnel vision on the far stretch of public trail in the distance below. Suddenly, her phone rings at full blast, almost sending her toppling over. She hurries to silence it, before being faced with not only a signal on her phone now, but, but to a call straight from Andy's phone. She freezes a moment before finally hanging up. She cannot hide her swelling anguish in the form of tears and puffed red cheeks as she clenches to remain silent, despite a painful, traumatic scenario. She hears another sound, and instead of waiting to see if it's another lizard, she takes her cue. Although, she would have never known. How could she have known the danger that wears many forms? Her vision tunnels as she comes to a bend in the trail where the rock wall to her right protrudes partially onto her running space. No matter. She positions herself and jumps into step when the protruding wall suddenly explodes directly at her, violently knocking her off her feet. Her wind is knocked out of her. She tries to gather what sense she has from being rattled and looks back to where she'd nearly been knocked off the trail. Standing nearly feet away, but towering over her. This large animated mass of rock with the silhouette of a humanoid monster tilts his head at her and begins to sway towards her with some large metallic object dragging it from behind him. She hurries to turn around and get back on her feet, but the rock man grabs her ankles and pulls her towards him. She turns and kicks with everything she's got, eventually to make solid contact to its face. And the attacker is finally forced to retreat for a moment revealing the face to be painted black around the eyes while seeing a glimpse of their under armor, rugged scarf and other tactical ranger wear, much like Andy's assailant. She clambers back to her feet. She runs back towards the way she came, only to witness a few of their others to have just hid behind something the moment she looked. A sinking down dawns on her. There may be no way out of this. In a moment, she turns around to face the inevitable. Her hunter vehemently lunges with a windmill-like sling in motion. But quick, desperate thinking has her fling her backpack in front of her. Her backpack instantly slumps to her feet, having been slashed at the shoulder strap and nearly in half altogether. Blood trickles next. Blood continues to profusely run from her wound. She had been gashed open from the left shoulder and down to her lower right side. Speechless, she awkwardly just turns away from her attacker and tries to walk away, stumbling only a few steps before painfully collapsing to the ground. She just silently sobbed with no air in her lungs from her shock and the assailant's footsteps right behind her. 
She can see the shadow of the monster patiently raise their large serrated machete into the air. The blade comes down, slowly. The tip of the blade slides down the side of her face, brushing past her hair follicles and down her temple, teasing to cut her skin down to the base of her neck. The blade comes to a stop, resting with its full weight atop her right collarbone. It begins to slide forward, uncaring of its full weight on its sharp edge and the discomfort of the slow opening cut. He lifts, as if mocking the ideal of knighting her. He raises the blade again, this time with two hands. She knows what this means. Miraculously, she bolts up. The blade manages to catch her outer thigh, but she powers through it. As she runs to the edge, she starts to see the others head this way. She knows she only has a moment with this burst of energy, and in that moment, she decides she's gonna take her fate into her own hands and leaps. It's funny how when you're in midair, you feel so free, like nothing can touch you. Charles constantly stumbles over his dehydrated and tired limbs, with his chest clenching and his throat going dry. He pushes himself to the edge of a summit, where he has a clear view of the valley below. He can see the parking lot. It's far, but he can make it. Something moves beside him. He huddles down and tries to make his way behind a body of terrain. He sits and waits for the coast to be clear. He listens intently for footsteps, thumps, any sort of intentional movement. Just on the other side of the rock. It sounded like someone scavenging the area, feeling around. You could even hear them shift their weight. Charles holds his breath. Charles follows the sound away. Charles weighs his options. To go back on the trail means to serve himself straight to them. This time he doubts luck will be in his favor. He can't stay here. Nothing feels safe. He looks down below him. Bushes, twigs, cacti, unforgivingly jagged and uneven terrain. It's obviously not a way recommended for human, but in this case, it suddenly looks like the best bet. Charles prepares himself, listening to his surroundings for one last moment. He hears noise, but it's far behind him. He takes this as his cue. He pushes himself off and sends himself down. He tries to maintain a controlled slide. There's no hiding now, as he crashes into the many dry bushes, undoubtedly making a parade of noise on his way out. Charles finally makes it down to the base of the mountain, where everywhere is covered in tall grass, and where he needs to be is just over that mountain. But when he turned around, all he could manage was to recognize that there were multiple bodies that he couldn't see the details of because they blended in so well with the landscape and the environment around them. Various patches of the grass behind him bend and crush into a trail leading straight to him. Charles finally snaps out of it. He looks back forward, lifts his knees high up on every step, hurting his own lungs to lunge forward uphill. A few fleeting questions float in Charles' mind as he runs. How long have they been doing this? How long have they lived here? Eventually, Charles would emerge tattered, worn, and stumbling around like a zombie near collapse. Apparently a lot of time has passed since the beginning of his running escape, because now the sun was down, it was a lot darker out, and a lot colder. He shivers, trying to drag himself through the dirt, hardly able to keep his head up. He stumbles past a familiar sign. He barely recognizes it. 
Against even his own self-exertion, he whips his head back to check the land behind him as his von Mir instinct. He gazes a moment, almost unwilling to believe he doesn't see movement. He realizes he's standing just beside the sign at the entrance, Welcome to Superstition Trails. Enter at your own risk. Without a moment of thought to spare, he turns away, continues walking. You can see the parking lot and everything from here. Normally it'd be a 12 minute walk. But now, having spent the better quarter of the day constantly running and hiding under the sun, completely dehydrated with no water, he's exerted. He finally remembers to check his phone. When he gets his phone out, he gets the screen on. It's at 3%, and the bars are still weak. He sits a moment within. He doesn't remember opening his car door. He doesn't remember reaching the parking lot. When he opens his eyes, as much effort as that turns out to be, he manages to lift his head up. He's surrounded with the commotion of very concerned strangers and onlookers. Someone in a uniform kneels next to him, shining a small flashlight into his eyes and asking him questions he can't quite hear. His eyes linger at the far corner of the very same parking lot. There's an ambulance, and there's a stretcher being wheeled in. He can't tell for sure, but... Maybe one could hope. Maybe. Another stretcher comes his way. They put a breather over his mouth and push his head back onto a stretcher. They take him up. They shut the doors. He shuts his eyes. It's been four months. Charles hasn't heard anything from Elena. And it's going to be a long time before... Officials have now taken in multiple stories of strange circumstances like this one. However, it's been difficult for authorities to reach a considerable amount of the mountain's area, leaving many of the uninitiated, uninformed, and unwitted to be left to their own peril and devices. It's most widely assumed that many of the tragedies that occur on the mountain are from those who become lost. Though Charles has now joined a minority of people, who claims that some of them were taken. Thank you for watching. This has been a reading featuring the voices of Ty Woolley, Shelby West, and Ryan Swagger, with an additional cameo of EHB of EHB Productions. Written, edited, and narrated by Eddie William Brooks. Thank you for watching, and stay safe out there.